But I want to ask you, do you ever think about Jesus' return? Do you ever think about Jesus' return? When we read through the New Testament, one of the resounding themes that's all over the place is that we should, we should indeed be thinking about that day. As you think about the day when he comes, what are your hopes? What are your expectations? Yeah, for some of us, we think about that day and, and what comes to mind is, one of the things that comes to mind is the excitement of, of being reunited with brothers and sisters who have passed away. One of the things that we might think about is how evil and sin struggles and the trials that we face, sicknesses and enemies and sorrows, all of these things will be done away with forever. One thing that we might think of is, is what it's like to be citizens of a kingdom where righteousness reigns where blessing abounds. Or perhaps we think of what it will be like to see Jesus face to face. See, James, like the rest of the authors of Scripture, he believes that we should always remember the return of Christ, that we should be thinking about that day moment by moment. And this morning, we're going to look at James, as we've said, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, where James is going to help us to think about two particular ways that the return of Christ should affect our hearts. The first of those is a warning about how we steward our wealth now in light of that day. And the second is an encouragement to patiently endure in every trial and also in light of that day. So last week, uh, Garrett preached for us, and we considered uh, you know, what it looks like to make plans as though God uh, actually exists, as though he is actually indeed sovereign, as though we actually believe that, that he rules over the arrangement of providence. What does it look like to believe that our plans come to pass if and only if it is his will? But planning is not the only area of life on which his rule comes to bear. To be a Christian, as James has been asserting all along throughout this entire book, is to bring every area of our lives, every area of how we interact with other people in the world, into subjection to Jesus. That's what it means to follow him. His rule comes to bear on how we use our tongues. We've seen that. Comes to bear on how we plan and how we steward those plans, as we considered last week. Comes to bear on how we steward our riches and our resources, as we're going to think about today. And James is giving us a call, and this call is to all who will hear it, to indeed hear it, knowing that Misery and judgment are what await those who oppose Christ. And what makes that opposition evident? Well, uh, one of the ways that it is evident that we oppose Christ is the way that we misuse the resources that he has entrusted to us at the expense of doing others good. And James is also giving us a call to all who will hear to patiently endure in faith until his coming, knowing that his salvation is certain, that when he comes, he will avenge all wrongs, he will avenge all injustices, and he will use every trial. We will see how he used every trial that was behind us for our good. What a, what a sweet promise. So if I was going to sum up the main passage or the main idea of the passage that we're looking at today, I would say this. Jesus, the just judge, is coming. So use your wealth in light of heaven 
and be patient in your trials. Again, Jesus, the just judge, is coming. So use your wealth in light of heaven and be patient in your trials. So the first section that we'll cover is use your wealth in light of heaven. This will be verses 1 through 6. I'll read that, and then we'll unpack uh, what is happening in these verses. Chapter 5, verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have corroded. And their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. So James begins this section with come now. So we, these are the same words that he used to begin his admonition in the previous section, as we said, to those who make plans as though God is not still sovereign over the world. In the same way, come now, in 5 verse 1, marks an introduction to another admonition. In this case, another arena in which one might be tempted toward unbelief. This is the arena of wealth. It's the arena of how a person stewards the resources, the the finances, the, the wealth that God has entrusted to him or her. This warning, as we see, is given to the rich. And the rest of the verses, so that's two through six, James is going to unpack what does he mean by rich? When he says rich, does that mean anyone who has money? What does he mean by rich? Right? So, yeah, so we'll say right from the get-go, merely having wealth, that's not the basis for the admonition that James is giving. Rather, it is a certain use of that wealth. It's a kind of use that I would broadly categorize as lacking awareness of God as both the giver of that wealth— and as the one before whom that wealth must be stewarded and accounted. This kind of use is use that is marked by unbelief. So James's call to them is to weep and to howl because the pleasures that they can afford now, that they're using their wealth to get, the indulgences in which they are partaking now, all of them are about to come to a sudden and and a striking end. They have lived their best life now, and what awaits them is misery. Right, so let's let's think about uh, verses 2 through 6. Let's think about these in in three ways uh, that the wicked rich have used their wealth. The first way is that they have stockpiled wealth. Okay, they've stockpiled wealth. So as we look at verses 2 and 3, we see James saying their riches have rotted. Their garments are moth-eaten. Their silver and their gold have corroded. So he's not intending for us to go, okay, let's, let's talk about the difference between how, uh, yeah, how riches rot and how garments get moth-eaten and, and how silver and gold corrode. Rather, what he's trying to do is paint for us a picture of all the things that you could count as treasure together. uh, Yeah, together these terms represent that. So in the term he uses in verse 3 to describe what they've done with their treasure is that they have laid up their treasure, right? They have stored it. They have stockpiled it. And as we've noted numerous times throughout the book, James always has his mind, it's very clear, he always has his mind on Jesus, particularly the Sermon on the Mount. So it's Matthew 5 through 7 where we see the Sermon on the Mount. And what's evident is that James is drawing on that sermon for much of this letter and and especially even these verses. 
So Matthew 6, from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this, verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, yeah, so you can see it's really obvious. Jesus' language is, it's the same kind of language that, that James is using. And what Jesus is going after in the Sermon on the Mount is treasure, their, their acquiring of treasure that will perish, right? Treasure that can be taken away from them. Because if the things of the world are your treasure, where is your heart going to be? It's going to be on the things of the world. It's going to be on what is passing away. And that kind of mentality, that is exactly what characterizes the treasure that these wicked, rich people have. It's rotten. It's moth-eaten. It's corroding. All these words are used as metaphors to speak uh, about its perishing nature, the fact that it is, it is going away. And to say that it's not being used to worship God or to do good to others. These people, what they have done is hoarded their things. And they've hoarded them not just in a vacuum, they've hoarded them at the neglect of others. What could that wealth be doing instead of sitting in the barn? And James is telling them that what they have done is disobey Jesus. What they have done is set their hearts in the last days, that is the days that are coming to an end, the final days of this age before Jesus returns. They have set their hearts on perishing stuff of a world that is about to be judged by Jesus. And so this, this worldly use of earthly wealth on that day when he comes, it will serve as evidence against them when they see him face to face. And it will, James says, it will eat their flesh like fire. Right, this is, a, this is intended to be terrible and sobering. This is intended to, yeah, to, to make us stop in our tracks and think about, wow, I don't want to be there. Right, this is a reference to the reality that they will be in misery as they face God's wrath in hell. Why? Because their usage of earthly wealth is evidence that the object of their faith, their true treasure, it's not Jesus. It's not Jesus. It's not obeying him. Their true treasure is the fleeting status and the feigned security that riches have to offer. The rich have stockpiled their wealth. But secondly, it's not the only thing they've done. They have also stolen wealth. They have stolen wealth. So the original hearers of James's letter uh, were part of an agrarian society where they depended upon crops, right? Crops had to be prepared and planted and harvested. And during this particular period of history, land often was owned by a increasingly small number of landowners, right? These landowners are very wealthy, and many people, all they, the, the only choice really they have is to hire themselves out to these landowners in order to earn a living. And by James's words, it, it seems that it wasn't uncommon for the rich having power over these people in that sort of vulnerable position it was not uncommon for the rich to find a reason not to pay them. Who's going to stop them? So in verse 4, James points out that the rich have fraudulently kept back the wages of those who have worked their land, mowing their fields, harvesting their crops. What the rich, or, yeah, what the rich know is that their laborers are too poor to be able to mount up a, a real defense so because they think they can get away with it, 
they take advantage of them. But listen to what God has to say about this in Deuteronomy 24. Deuteronomy 24, 15. It's, it's actually 14 and 15. You shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in your land within your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor and counts on it, lest he cry out against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. And so hired worker, a hired worker depends on his wages being paid when they're supposed to be paid, right? Whenever you go to work and you're supposed to get a paycheck, you expect to get it when it's agreed upon, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's no different. A worker going to work and doing what was agreed upon, he is expected to be paid immediately. And according to Deuteronomy 24, his money was not even to be held for a day. And if it was, should that money be withheld, that worker had good reason to cry out to the Lord against that employer. That employer, to do that to an employee is sinful. And it's evident the rich, they're not withholding these riches because they can't pay. How do we know that? They got stuff in their barns that's rotting and corroding. The poor man may not know all of that. They may hear whatever excuse the, the, the landowner gives, and they might go, okay, well, I guess they can't pay me right now. That They might not know that, but God knows. God sees every act of injustice. And so by withholding the wages that they were, they were owed, the rich were, uh, yeah, they were, in some cases, they're actually turning workers into slaves. And in other cases, they're guilty, it says, James says, of condemning and murdering them. That's verse 6. Now, how does that work? How, how does not paying a wage, how does that make someone guilty of murder, of condemnation? Well, the worker's ability to put food on his table is dependent on what? It's dependent on him getting his money. Maintaining a roof over his head depends on him getting his money. His ability to pay his bills depends on him getting paid his money. And for some who live paycheck to paycheck, to get behind on that single payment is to not eat. And for a worker to not be paid is to make them vulnerable to other injustices too. And is at times, effectively, it is to condemn them to die. Jeremiah twenty two thirteen. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness, and his upper rooms by injustice, who makes his neighbor serve him for nothing and does not give him his wages. See, James says that those withheld wages, he personifies them. He says they are crying out to God against the rich. And does God hear them? Yes, he does. God hears them. He hears them in the same way that he heard when the blood of Abel cried out from the ground. That's the same language. When Cain killed Abel and the blood of Abel cries out from the ground to him, it's back in Genesis 4, and he has the same regard for justice in this day that he did on that day. So it's not, it's not a mistake. He's referred to as the Lord of hosts here. It's not a mistake. It's not just random. Lord of hosts, the commander of the heavenly armies, he will with great might and without fail avenge every wrong. So the rich have stockpiled wealth and they have stolen wealth. And thirdly, they have also self-indulged with, with their wealth. Verse 5, the wicked rich are about their own pleasure and luxury and excessiveness 
they've lived as though they're about, uh, they've lived as though they're subject and responsible to no one. They don't have to answer to anyone. They've said yes to every pleasure that their heart desires. They have said no to anything that might inconvenience them or stand in the way of fulfilling those desires. Right, so these rich are, they're going to nice parties and they're keeping up with the latest fashion trends. They have massive TVs and extravagant cars. They're going on lavish vacations. They're doing big home additions. Mind you, all the while, their workers and their servants can't pay their rent. They can't provide for their families. Why? Because these same rich that are doing all those things are also withholding what they owe to others. See, they think that they're just fattening themselves on good food and satisfying whatever lust they might fancy, whatever their money can buy them. But the reality is that by means of those things, what they're actually doing is fattening themselves for the day of slaughter. Again, this is another reference to the day that Jesus will return and the unjust will be judged by him. To Jesus, the just judge, he is coming back. We've been talking about this category of rich. We've been talking about those people because the original audience needed to hear that, but the reality is so do we. We need to hear this too. Think about your own life. Think about your own use of wealth. Are you like the rich that James is describing? If we opened up your bank account, we opened up your checking account, what is your wealth? How you think about your wealth, how you obtain it, how you use it, what does it say about where your treasure lies? Listen, as I said earlier, I, w- I want to be really clear here. We're not saying that it's wrong to be rich, per se. Having a lot of resources is not the problem. What I'm asking, what James, I think, is, is, is asking, is whether your wealth is truly and wholly submitted to Jesus, whether you use it like he is your king whether you use it like it doesn't actually belong to you. You are a steward of it, and it belongs to him. Do you hoard and stockpile earthly goods for your own security in a way that maybe secretly helps you depend on God less? You have to think about that. Do you hoard and stockpile earthly goods while your neighbors and brothers and sisters go without what they need? Do you open your eyes? Do you see what the needs of those around you are? How do you obtain your wealth? Does it come to you honestly? Or have you done or are you now even doing shady business? Fudging numbers? Cheating on taxes? And then, yeah, we can think about it's, it's good. Not only is it good to be rich, it can be good to own a business. It can be good to be over workers, to have authority. It can be good to have employ, employees that work for you. Sometimes, yeah, this, don't let this rich, the category of rich, let you check out. Don't check yourself out here. Sometimes it, it could be as easy as do you hire somebody to do some work for you? Do you hire somebody to come and fix some plumbing at your house? When you have authority over someone, how do you treat them? Do you bully and disrespect them because you have the money? Or do you threaten to withhold their wages so that you can get them to do a little bit more than what they originally agreed to? Can people depend on you when it comes to money? If you hear these questions and you're thinking about your wealth and you're thinking about how you got it and there's, there's some, something over here that's screaming out to you right now, yeah, that part of my money, it came dishonestly. 
I just want to exhort you, do something about it today. Make it right. And it's not wrong either, necessarily, to have a nice house or to take a nice vacation. But as you do those things, how does, again, the reality of Jesus' kingdom, how does it factor into this area for you? Is your stuff, the things that you have, is it used in service of his kingdom? Is it used not merely on your own kingdom? Do you use what you have simply for your own indulgence, or do you see it as means to show hospitality to others, to care well for others, and particularly even those who could never repay you back because they don't come from the same means. They can't, they can't turn around and do the same thing for you that you just did for them. Yeah, do you use what you have to show hospitality to those who have need? Yeah, if you're good at acquiring wealth, some people just are good at it. They know how to go out and do it. Do you think about how to, how to do it so that you can give to those in need? The exhortation here is spend your wealth to obtain treasures in heaven. Spend your wealth to see souls of people saved and lives changed by the proclamation of the gospel. Proclaim his kingdom. Invest your wealth to see that happen. Invest your wealth to show the love of Christ to others, not so that you can get something in return, but so that you can simply express Christ's love. Yeah, are you giving to gospel ministry? As you think about giving to the church, do you give to your local church, whether it's this one or another one that, that if you're visiting with us and you're a part of, do you give to your local church? Do you, do you realize that when you give to your local church, what you are enabling is for pastors to have the time to prepare sermons to proclaim the gospel and to evangelize and to disciple people to help them mature in Christ to help them think about how they can go and help others follow Jesus. What you're giving money to is caring for the members of our community and the, the members of our church who have needs so that they can experience the tangible love of Christ practically as people help them meet those needs. You're giving to gospel going out. We support, our church supports, and, and many churches support workers around the world who are going and taking the gospel to places where it's not proclaimed. We're seeking to see churches multiply to places where there's maybe not currently healthy churches. Are you giving to gospel ministry? And I just want to say here, I personally, and I imagine this is true for all of our pastors, I'm so encouraged by the way that you guys step up and give when you know of needs. Right, so last year we had a pandemic, right? I think the question going into the lockdowns and shutdowns, yeah, are we about to, are we gonna, are we gonna be able to continue running all the stuff we're running? Are we gonna lose money? But yeah, the Lord in his kindness more than supplied all that we need. And then we had, uh, yeah, we gave uh, requests for benevolence needs. There were benevolence needs popping up, and you guys overwhelmingly gave money to that. So, I, yeah, I just want to say I praise God for you. I praise God, uh, yeah, for the ways that good fruit is evident in you as, as a church family with how you do meet these needs. There are many in our church, there are friends of our church who are faithfully, sacrificially using their wealth to bless others and to enable gospel ministry in some of the ways that I've been described, really all the ways that I've been describing. But while I commend you in these things, I also want to exhort you to not brush off what James is saying, to not push it aside to seriously consider his admonition and whether there might be more love 
for the world in you with how you think about your resources than you might be willing to acknowledge. Don't say, well, I'm not rich. I'm not rich, so this doesn't apply to me. Don't say, well, this warning is for non-Christians, but I'm a Christian, so this is not for me. And don't, don't hide behind those things. Because as I think about how this is framed and what James is doing with what he's saying and the exhortations that he's giving with, with how faith proves itself and works, yeah, it's not the warning that's given. It's the response to it that proves who belongs to Jesus. Right? So in, in that regard, don't look to labels. Oh, rich. I'm rich or I'm not rich. I'm Christian. I'm not a Christian. Don't look to those to let you off. Think about how you're obeying Jesus. Okay? Look to him. Yeah, so as, again, as James has been saying all along, what you do with what God says, that is the evidence of what you actually believe. It's true of how you use your tongue, how you plan, how you think about your time, how you use your wealth, and whether or not you yeah, think of and through favoritism treat other people made in God's image simply as means to gain for yourself. All of these things are proof. They're proving grounds of whether your faith is in Christ or something else. So as we think about all that, as we look at the verses, as we look at the tense, the way it's framed, James isn't actually giving an explicit call to repentance here, is he? He's not, he didn't say, so turn away from that and you will be saved. He is admonishing, he, he, is, he is saying, if you're rich and you use your money this way, weep and howl for what is coming to you. But guys, if you hear this, if you're in this room, if you're listening on live stream, if you hear this and you know yourself to be guilty in, in some of these ways and you still are breathing, which is everyone who hears, it is not too late to turn away. It is not too late to obey Jesus. It is not too late to repent and forsake your sin. See, 1 Peter 3, 18 says that he suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring us to God. Jesus died for sinners like you and like me. And then on the third day, he was raised for sinners. And if you, hearing this, if you will repent, you will unite yourself to him by faith, he will most certainly save you. And his grace is more than sufficient to cover every one of your sins. So repent and hold your wealth and hold your possessions with open hands to him. It's true here as it often is in many of the things that we seek to obey in that you may not do it imperfectly. Or you may not do it perfectly. You, may, you will certainly do it imperfectly. But that doesn't mean that you should be flippant about it. You should care. So if you would follow Jesus, you have to fight. You have to work to obey him. You have to take up your cross and follow him. He is coming. And because that is true, we have to be mindful to use our wealth in light of heaven. And then secondly, our second main point, because he is coming, be patient in your trials. Be patient in your trials. Verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. 
You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So this, this section begins with, the, yeah, it begins with the, the phrase, be patient, therefore. And so as, as we yeah, know, anytime we see a therefore, uh, yeah, because the Lord has heard the cries of those who have been wronged and treated unjustly, as we saw in the last section, because of the sins, uh, because the sins of the unrighteous will be avenged, what should God's children do? Be patient. Be patient until the coming of the Lord. Because the promise of his return, this is what provides fuel for that. For Christians to have patience when facing persecution and trials of every kind, as James has been, again, unpacking the entire book. And that includes the injustice that is committed against us by others. And so James is going to give us an example Right? The example of a farmer. A farmer's job, it's not easy. He often gets up very early, goes to bed late. He's got to work hard. He prepares his fields in the off season. He mows them and plows them and he works in his fertilizer. And then when it's time, he plants his seeds. Right? That's all, that's all hard work. And what does he do after he plants his seeds? Well, in a place like that, a place like where James's hearers are, he waits. He waits for rain. Doesn't have an irrigation system that pumps in water, which also comes from the Lord, to be clear. Um, But he waits. That's all he can do, right? He can't make rain. Even if he could make rain, he can't make it make something grow. That's God's work. God makes things grow. And then in due time, after a period, a long perhaps period of waiting, and with the Lord giving what is necessary, that field abounds with a plentiful harvest of good fruit. That's what comes. Right? If any of you, maybe closer to home, if any of you, Uh, like to garden, you'll know that, yeah, it's rewarding when you watch and you wait for weeks and for months. You you plant your little seeds and you watch them, you watch them grow and they, they pop out of the ground. You're like, oh, hey, you know, you're out of the ground. Or yeah, and then that first set of leaves comes and then that second set of leaves comes and then Yeah, and then more leaves come, and okay, now it's big enough to put outside, so now I'm putting it outside, and I'm watching it grow and grow. And then, oh, there's a bloom. Oh, there's fruit. And then eventually, what happens? Your fruit's ready. You get to pick it, and you get to eat it. How rewarding, and how sweet. And what an amazing picture that God gives to us. It's like he did that. He's done the whole thing so that we could learn some things from it. Right, James exhorts Christians under trial in the same way that that happens, you be patient because the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That's back in chapter one. We can be patient by establishing our hearts, as he says, by establishing or leaning hard upon the truth that Jesus' return is coming near and that he is using the trials that we are facing now to, to grow us. And not only to grow us, to, but, but in the end to produce good fruit in us as we wait in hope for him. And when that day comes, when he returns, what we're going to see is that every bit of waiting, every bit of endurance, every bit of fruit that he will have produced in us, it will all be worth it. Every last bit of sorrow and trial that we face now, it will have all been worth it. And this kind of patient posture, it's not one that comes naturally to us. 
it must be prayerfully worked for. Right? This kind of patient posture is, is actually fruit of the Lord's Spirit working in us so that we might will and work for his good pleasure. This is God's work in us. And often, close at hand, when we're trying to obey this, when we're trying to be patient, there's temptation. Temptation toward doing exactly the opposite, being impatient, and particularly, as James connects here, grumbling. Right? Grumbling is the faithless expression of frustration in the midst of suffering or disappointment. Yeah, so when trials come, often we are tempted to grumble against one another, and ultimately, our grumbling against one another, who is it really ultimately directed toward? God. It is a grumbling against the one who arranges providence. Listen, I don't, yeah, I think this is probably true for all of us, but I find it's a lot more difficult to be patient when there's actually need to be patient, right? When, there's, when it's time to be patient, now it's hard to be patient. Yeah, sometimes it might be as little as, oh, seems like the pandemic is, is almost over because there's a lot more cars on the road and that person just cut me off. And that person is driving really slow. Or that person is tailing me. Why? What is wrong with them? Right? So I don't know about you, but those are things that happen in my own heart. And these are, man, these are, these are little, some little bitty stuff. How much more whenever you're facing poverty and you're facing persecution and oppression? And yet, even in that context, James's exhortation is, do not grumble against one another so that you may not be judged. I think it's, yeah, again, it's very intentional that he refers to them as brothers here, as brothers and sisters, when he gives the exhortation here. Why? To remind us that we're family to remind brothers and sisters who have been redeemed by Christ, who both are waiting for him, that we are united together as one, as one body. So, yeah, knowing that Jesus is coming back, yeah, what is your own perspective like in these things? Are you able to wait patiently without grumbling toward against your brothers and sisters? Are you patient with them knowing that actually taking up your cross and being patient toward them, preserving unity in Christ, these things are pleasing to God? Do you know that? Yeah, how do you react as you think about yeah, recent days? How, how do you react when the expectations that you have of other brothers and sisters are not met? Or how do you react when they disappoint you or they let you down? Or when they think differently than you do about what to do in a pandemic? Or how to think about masks and vaccines? Or how we're supposed to vote for elected officials Do you grumble against them because they're just socially different than you? Or because you're offended that you didn't get invited to dinner or to a party or out on a date? Or because you think they should be more mature than they are? Is your answer to grumble against them or to lovingly talk to them? so that love between brothers and sisters would prevail. That's what it looks like to be patient. 
Do you use your tongue to curse people made in the image of God? And, and some, some of you, these are all could be perspective kind of things. They could be, yeah, us having different conscious uh, yeah, positions on, on some of these things. But what about when you're legitimately sinned against? Do you have a posture of, of willingness to forgive? If things aren't resolved quickly in the way that they should be, are you willing to entrust justice to God? who is the one who judges justly? Or are you determined to get vengeance for yourself? Romans 12, 19 to 21, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So if those words of Paul in Romans 12 indicate how we're supposed to deal with an enemy, yeah, how should we deal with brothers and sisters in Christ? Should we show them any less than feeding them or giving them a drink or giving them kindness? No. We certainly shouldn't grumble against them. We have to remember, guys, we have to remember that God uses trials to conform us to the image of Jesus. And this is a good thing. We want this. We don't want trials in a vacuum. We don't want them by themselves. But what we do want is the good fruit that God produces through them. We want him to conform us one degree of glory at a time more and more and more to the likeness of Jesus. We want this. James is suggesting that remembering the way God works in our trials and waiting for Jesus' return, he is saying this is the antidote for grumbling. If we grumble against one another, rather than bearing with and living with and loving one another, this is actually unbelief. This is actually disobedience to what the Lord has called us to. That is the way of the world, not the way of following Jesus. So guys, work at this. Pray for this. Trust that the Lord can and does work these things in his people. And James says, if we don't repent from this, when he comes, we will also be judged by him. He's standing at the door. He is coming. Do we, do we really believe that? Because if you think about being in the heat of trials, right, sometimes... When we're, it's, it's real easy to say, yeah, we have to endure in trials, but when we're actually in the middle of them, is that easy? Yeah, I see a couple of head nods. No, it's not easy. It's really hard. Sometimes it's really hard to see beyond our own circumstances in that moment. And so when that happens, one of the things that I think is really helpful, one of the things that I think is really important is that we have examples we have examples of others to look to that help us see outside of ourselves, to help us go, oh, that person went through some really hard stuff and they endured. Man, that's encouraging to me. Yeah, sometimes those examples sober us to what's actually happening as we face trials and, and they also remind us of the blessings that come with endurance. And so as James says here, Look to the prophets. What did the prophets do? Well, they spoke in the name of the Lord with his authority be on, on his behalf. And the scripture tells us what happened to them. Well, some were ridiculed. Some were told to stop speaking. Some were beaten. 
Some were even put to death. Matthew 5, 11 to 12, blessed are you when, you, when, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Yeah, we have, we have friends in the fire. And when we look at their lives and we look at their endurance, we consider them what? They didn't fall away. They believed all the way to the end. We consider them what? We consider them blessed. We can go, of course, of course they were blessed. Praise God, I want that too. Lord, help me to be like them. We've also heard, James tells us, of Job. I'm not sure if everyone in here knows the story of Job, but if you don't, Job was considered a righteous man and in his day, just over 3,000 years ago, he was the wealthiest man in the East. The Bible says that he was blessed by God. And in one single day, he lost everything. He lost every bit of riches that he had. He lost all of his livestock. He had thousands. He lost all of his servants. And he lost all of his children. He lost them to death. And what's clear as we look at the book of Job is that what God was doing was using him as a means to show his own glory in the heavenly realms. That's one thing he's doing. And as we've talked about in previous weeks, God at any moment is doing a thousand things. That's one thing he's doing. He's showing his glory in the heavenly realms. Was that about Job? That wasn't even about Job. (laughs) He was using Job to do something great. But It's also about something he's going to do in Job, right? At the same time that he's doing that, he's revealing more of himself to Job and to Job's friends in ways that Job, at the end of the book, confesses that he, yeah, he's humbled by. Job, in the end, is thankful for this. In chapter 42, verse 5 of Job, he confesses, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now... My eye sees you. That change, that would never have occurred apart from his suffering. God used suffering to bless Job. And in the end, that, the end of that last chapter, it says that the Lord restored the fortunes of Job and blessed his latter days more than his beginning. He's a great example because in it, we have seen God's purpose. That what God means for his people, even if we can't fathom how it's going to be accomplished when we're in the middle of it, what God means for his people is to show them mercy and compassion. And I just, I also want to say, brothers and sisters, I have watched some of you can't endure some of the hardest trials. Cancer, deaths in your families, deaths in your wombs, hatred. Rejection from your family members. I've watched you be dragged into court and have injustices committed against you. I've watched you be persecuted and ridiculed for following Jesus. And the list could go on. 
And when I was writing these things, I see your faces. And I praise God that in all of them, you have acted, you have acted like Christians. To watch the way that you have trusted God in your trials, believing truly in Christ's reign and his return, it's been an encouragement to the faith of many in this room, in this church, outside of this room, outside of this church. It's been encouragement to my own faith. So I just want to say, as you endure in your trials, thank you. Just like the prophets, just like Job in the scriptures, you serve as examples. And, of course, the greatest example that we have of suffering and of patience is Jesus himself, who put on flesh and lived a perfect life in obedience to God in every way, as we sang about earlier, the whelming weight of true obedience was carried by him and him alone. He had no sin. He did not deserve to die. But because of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross on behalf of sinners like you and me. John chapter 3 that says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, to satisfy his wrath against sin, his just wrath against sin, so that you and I could be forgiven. And so that our trials would not have the final say over us. You see, patiently trusting the Father, it led Jesus to death. And what did Jesus do? He trusted him all the way. He knew that what was on the other side was resurrection and joy. So raised by the power of the Spirit at the Father's command, death was crushed to death for all who would patiently hope in Jesus. And his endurance enables our own endurance by the power of his Spirit, the same Spirit that raised him from the dead. And he gives hope and he gives joy to you and to me in our trials so that on the other side of them, Resurrection is ours. Eternal life is ours. All of this is so that we ought praise him. And then finally, as James exhorts us in verse 12, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. So when you read commentaries about this, however many commentaries you read, there are about that many positions on why this is here. Um, I do think that what seems to make the most sense of what this does here is in light of the context, yeah, is that when facing trials, what's a person tempted to do? Well, perhaps to take an oath in order to strengthen or reinforce or even bring about the things that he's saying, perhaps so that he can change an outcome by the intensity of his word. I think Jesus, because we know, yeah, how the, the way that, that James is drawing on Jesus back in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 34 to 37, I think, I think this is helpful, it says this. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of a great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply yes, or let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. I think in effect, Jesus is telling us that heaven and earth do not belong to us. We don't have the power to bring about by an oath 
any more than we can bring about without one. Right? We're not in control of anything. We are small. God is great. He is sovereign over the trials that we face. We are called to simply speak the truth at all times and to trust him. We are to be patient in our trials. Yes, of course, this, this still means that we cry out to him when we're in the midst of them. Yes, it means that we lament injustice and evil and sin. But in all of it, we believe him and we trust him. So will you patiently trust him? He is coming. Set your eyes, set your hearts on that day. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your good word. We thank you for your good promises. Thank you that you love your people. We thank you that you are a powerful God. You alone rule over all of creation, and you have the power to do everything that you say. And you say, Lord, that everything that comes about in our lives, both easy and hard, you say that you will use all of them for our good. So, Lord, would you help us to trust you? Would you help us to be patient in our trials? Would you help us even to be willing to endure hardship, to endure injustice in order to obey you, in order to follow you, in order to glorify you? For we have seen our Lord Jesus do this. Would you make us more like him? God, we pray that you would help us, Lord, as we've talked about today, to think well about how we steward our wealth, Lord, that we would steward all of it in light of your kingdom. God, we pray that you would make us more like Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen.